I'm really excited to be able to do this first episode with my good friend Pip Jameson. Uh, she is the founder of The Dots, it's an amazing business and social network and we have become mentors and mentees to each other at different points in our journey. Pip's journey has had some really highs but also some really lows. Some of those include some public stumbles but one thing that's really inspired me about her is her ability to not just be a great leader and take accountability for where things have gone wrong, but then to use those experiences to make her an even better founder. I am a non-tech tech founder, so I don't have a computer science degree. I, I literally was just one of these naive people that wanted to just make a business, a tech business. I saw 60% of our revenue disappear wow. overnight. Um, and it was just terrifying. And my board um, were encouraging me to get rid of my team. Uh, or a lot of my team to basically extend our runway. So I always made them the promise that if something went wrong with the dots, I would find you another role before. And that was the one time I wasn't going to be able to keep that promise because mm. there was no jobs going in COVID. There's an incident that happened a few years ago um, where actually, do you know what I'm referring to with the uh, recruitment process? Mm. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about that story? And we got a really um, big backlash on Twitter. Um, and it was probably... <laughs> Probably the worst 24 hours of my, 24 hours of my life. Oh, actually, that sounds really dramatic, but it probably was. <laughs> 24 hours of my career. Yeah. There's some yeah. stuff that happens. Um, and I can understand why it happened. I'm Claude Williams, the founder of Dream Nation, and welcome to the Behind the Dreams podcast. Hi, Pip. Hey, Lord. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? Do you know what? It's just really nice to see you in real life. I know. It's been so long. Oh, I think. It's amazing to be here. Yeah. I was just saying, like, we haven't seen each other in the real world for loads and loads. Yeah. So it's so hard to remember. <laughs> anyway, go. Because <laughs> I think, yeah, it was Google that yeah. we saw each other. And yeah, so, yeah. But then this crazy thing called COVID happened. Yeah. I mean, we've seen each other virtually, but it's really nice to be with you. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And, um, yeah, no, it's been it's been a journey because I guess the first time we went was twenty fourteen, right, or twenty fifteen, fifteen. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Um, do you know what? I'm really bad at dates, but yeah, it would have <laughs> been like yeah, I was speaking at Dream Nation, and and it was such an amazing event. I've never been so terrified because it's the first <laughs> time I've ever spoken without slides. Really? Because oh, yes. I use slides yeah. to remind myself what to say. Yeah. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have to do it without slides. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, there was such an amazing crowd and everyone was really supportive and I did remember what I had to say mm. in the end after rehearsing it a million <laughs> times. <laughs> they, they really did love you. Um, I don't know. I think... I still have the recording sitting in a hard drive somewhere that I should have on YouTube, but you know, just one of those things that just never get around to doing. So yeah, so hopefully by the time people watch this, I would have um, actually got my app but, together, <laughs> got that online. Only what, seven years too late. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you was amazing. You really was, so thank you so much for that. Um, for today, I did want to have a conversation with you about difficult decisions. So as a amazing founder that you are, you have made some really tough choices that have led to some really great outcomes. So I'd love to explore how you went about making those decisions um, and also share, I guess, any lessons that people can learn from your process as well. I'm like, it was so funny when you asked me to talk about this because in my head, I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I make decisions? But actually <laughs> then it made me think about making decisions. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to share, I guess, my process, which isn't always right, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But and I think that's the game. Yeah. Um, in reality, as practical dreamers, we have to just make the choices um, and we will never know if they're right or wrong in the moment. Um, it's just hindsight. So with all that said, one of your first major decisions was around your first company. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the story? Yeah, so I am a non-tech tech founder, so I don't have a computer science degree. I, I literally was just one of these naive people that wanted to just make a business, a tech business. So um, I started my first tech business in Australia. Um, I had a co-founder um, and it was a bit like a baby sister version of The Dots. It was a creative networking platform. Um, and, you know, I probably made every mistake you probably could make on your first business. Um, uh, the biggest challenge was um, actually me and my founder wanted different things from the business. And so, um, 
they always say you should never go into business with someone um, who hasn't got like the same, I guess, values as you or the same work ethic or the same skills. I did all three. We had the same skills, different work ethics and different <laughs> values. So I basically made all the mistakes you could make from a co-founder decision. But very long story short, um, we wanted to take the business in different directions. Yeah, what were those directions? So um, I wanted to kind of go international, expansion, grow the business. He really wanted a lifestyle business. Right. and. And those things aren't, and I, I have no criticism for anyone who ever wants a lifestyle business. We just wanted different things. Mm. Um, and so it just got increasingly challenging day to day. And so I ended up having to leave the business. I sold the business. Um, all the money I made from the business, I reinvested into the dots. So I yeah. funded the dots. So it's like all eggs, one basket. My yeah. poor husband finally <laughs> made some money. <laughs> and and you're gonna like, oh. do it all again, <laughs> blow it all again. Um, and then I had to restart all over again. Um, and it was really, because you, you know what it's like, you put your love into a business and it yeah. becomes almost like your child. So it's yeah. really tough to go through that and lots of highs and lows. But yeah, it was in hindsight, the right decision. Yeah. Before we, um, I guess, talk about the dots, mm. what was it that actually got you to make that choice? So you said it, the pressure was getting worse, et cetera, but what was the cutting off point where I need to choose between? I, I mean, that one, to be honest, was a, ne a necessity. Like it mm. just wasn't sustainable. Um, so I think more I was forced into that decision. I think the harder thing is then the decisions you make after that. So you actually, when I was going through that process, you go through a decision of, do you play hardball and mm. maybe step outside your value set and start being the sort of business person I never wanted to be? Yeah. Or do you recognize this isn't working? It's becoming quite toxic. I'm going to just try and be the better person and let yeah. it go. And I think that was more the decisions like I wanted to stay true to who I was and mm even though it's horrific giving up one business, I just didn't want to fight in a nasty way to save it, yeah. which was my only other option at the time. <laughs> was you able to maintain that relationship? No, sadly not. Um, and so it was one of those really horrific kind of times where, mm. you know, you just, if I look back, um, I wish we'd communicated much earlier about yeah. it it just had spiraled to the point that it it wasn't sustainable after that yeah so to hear that i think for myself uh you might not know this but dream nation is actually like the sixth or seventh like business projects that i've done um but for the first like five or six all of them but before dream nation i did that with uh, my best friend um his name is bola and yeah like we were yeah we've always like been each other's back for that um, so it's the first time I stepped out without without him on that. But when he, when we came to the decision of me like going into Dream Nation versus running what we had called the Creative Circle at the time, which was like a marketing agency, mm -hmm. it was we were lucky in the sense that we had already had those, those conversations around like the values, work ethic, etc., and the contracts we had between each other. Um, literally said like if we ever get to the point where the business is gonna impact our friendship, then that's the time to walk away. Um, and that's what was happening. Like we were beginning to want different things, move in different directions and was able to actually have that, that conversation beforehand. And so now he's still my best friend, like his children are my godchildren, best man at his wedding, et cetera. So yeah, like, I'd, I wish other founders had that information before mm -hmm. at the start of their journey of like, that communication what you need to have decided between yourselves yeah communication is key like not just for co-founder relationships but everything like yeah. i learned such an important lesson which was don't let things fester i kind of in that first business i was trying to just fix things mm -hmm. and cover up the the cracks and yeah. now with this business i'm very much like if there is a problem i'll address it because yeah. actually you don't know unless you know and yeah. so if you're let, letting something fester mm -hmm. it's you that's getting wound up they just might not know and actually if you address it straight away it's so much better and so yeah i learned that the very hard, the hard way, way. <laughs> <laughs>
thank you for listening to today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you sign up to our mailing list at dreamnation.co forward slash mailing list. And from there, you'll be able to find out about all the things that we have coming for you. Please make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube or whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. Don't forget to like this video as well. With the dots, your your, your current baby, mm. um, being successful for quite a while now, you would have had to make quite a few big decisions. Obviously, you're not in Australia anymore. Um, and obviously as well, like you are now a solo founder in that regard. Could you walk us through making those choices around like why you made them, how you got to them, et cetera? Yeah, so I mean, I was so passionate about creating a networking platform that allowed people to find opportunities and really level the playing field. So that was the same vision for the platform in Australia. So mm. I just wasn't ready to let that go. So I restarted it all over here. Um, I think the that was kind of a no-brainer decision because I was someone once said to me like if I gave you a million pounds tomorrow for mm. your previous business would you take it and yeah. I was like no and then you realize how passionate you are so yeah. if you're ever wondering like do you want to sell a business or not ask yourself that maybe a hundred thousand or ten thousand mm. um but yeah so the kind of starting again and while I'm a sole founder I do have an amazing founding team yeah. who've actually been with me right from the beginning so right. I have to give them credit for this whole journey mm. as well but I am sole founder and CEO but yeah I mean for me it was just about democratizing the creative industries opening up access for everyone so in the early days it was very much like profiles and jobs yeah we realized very quickly, particularly in the creative industries, that most people do not get a job through applying for a job mm -hmm. on a job board. Mm -hmm. um, actually, most opportunities come through a network yeah. and through meeting people, and especially in the freelance space. And like everything you did at the events and Dream Nation, bringing people together to do that networking, that's really actually where the magic happens. Yeah. So again, somewhat naively, we were like, okay, jobs aren't good for our community in some ways because it's quite depressing when you apply for a job have 500 people apply you yeah. don't get a response for a company mm -hmm. so we were like actually to really help our community we have to move really heavily into the community networking space mm -hmm. so yeah we just basically worked out how do we build an engaged community of really a platform where no one has something necessarily in common apart from they worked in the creative industry so we yeah. spent five years working out how do we bring value to yeah. people community and networking so what you're saying i guess if we were and i know i know we don't do technical that much in this podcast but you're really talking about product market fit yeah. so trying to find like the right product for the right people um and it, like you said it took you five years to get there like what was that process like trying to find the right answer yeah, I mean, it was literally test, iterate, test, iterate. I mean, when we first started out, we were really guilty of going, oh, I've got this brilliant idea for the platform. And then we'd spend mm. like a month building it only to find like three people click that button <laughs> and actually <laughs> used it. Mm. And so we then got a lot better at doing tests on the site. So let's test a feature. Let's actually just build the button, see if anyone clicks it and then have a little thing that says coming soon. Yeah. So we got a lot better at that process. And mm. then it was just looking at, kind of the data, how people are using it, and a lot of kind of in-person chats with our community as well to make it more valuable for them. But I think what the secret source was is just a recognition that we wanted to connect people in the real world as yeah. much as digital. So, you know, that is the stuff that you did is where the magic happens. So yeah. how do we help our community find out about amazing events and networking opportunities where they can actually make magic yeah. together? Kind of. So going back to the idea of decision making so even though I don't know if you realised it but you did walk us through one way to make a choice um, which is that te idea of testing things out um, don't do necessarily all the work just find what is the simplest way to run that experiment and decide whether it's worth doing the investment or not yeah there's a brilliant book oh my gosh it's dyslexic lean brain startup. <laughs> there's lean startup but there's another one which is um, testing business ideas okay. is another brilliant book on that and it's mm -hmm. everything from like surveys chatting to your community just testing things it's a great way to kind of cycle through yeah. and i think as founders you know what it's like we've got so many ideas mm. all the time yeah. so test and learn test learn test learn make a lot of mistakes but yeah. kind of acknowledge they're the wrong mistakes and move on to the next thing so yeah. funnily enough we've probably taken as much code out of the dots as we put in it because right. there's so many tests that went live that totally failed yeah. <laughs> that we had to sort of take out mm. of the process have you ever gone against what the date has told you when you're making a decision and what was the consequence of that yes i i actually i i i, I love using data as one of the data points but mm -hmm. i think it's really important that 
the community, the data can tell you one thing, like a button yeah. can tell you one thing, but there could be so many problems with that button. It could be the wrong wording, it could be in the wrong place, it could be, so working off that instinct of what actually do my community really need, yeah. that's the more important bit for me, using the data to validate it, mm -hmm. but actually listening to people and trying to help those people is I find the more magic, the magic bit for me. Yeah, yeah, and but, I guess what informs your instincts? So yeah, how do you how do you instinctively know what people your community need? Um, I think well, we're both dyslexic. <laughs> we have a kind of a a dyslink dis yeah, that's my dyslexia sometimes. <laughs> I my mispronounced word. Um, so we have a distinct advantage where I mean if you think about humans being like the most sophisticated robots that exist, mm -hmm. you know. Um, we take in data all the time and information all the time in the real world and we synthesize that into like intuition and gut feeling. Yeah. The advantage of being a dyslexic is we tend to take in more information from the world. So our intuition tends to be more honed and there's loads of research on this. So anyone who's listening who's a dyslexic it is a superpower. <laughs> um, but um, so yeah, I think that instinct of taking in the data and kind of acting on gut, but then using other you know, the team, the community, the data to also validate that gut. Yeah. Gut's not always right, mm. but it really does help on that journey, particularly if you're yeah. There was, I remember years ago when I came to your office, um, you just gave me some advice around planning for apps, but there was something that you was doing that was seemed quite unique to me mm. around um, neurodiversity in your team. Uh, if I remember correctly, you would deliberately hire people with certain like neurodiversities to do certain roles. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, I've always had to be really open about my dyslexia. So, mm. you know, I, there are challenges, obviously. So my yeah. written, my written and pronunciation, sometimes the words aren't so good. But, and we both now have, and I've started having an email signature that says, just lightfully dyslexic excuse yeah. typos. I'd completely stole that Yeah, from no, you. I'm so <laughs> glad you did. And anyone who's listening, steal delightfully <laughs> dyslexic excuse typos and put it at the end of your email. <laughs> because it goes from people going, oh, they're an idiot. To, yeah, oh, uh, the Oh, context. I, I understand, yeah. context. Um, but because I guess I was always so open about it, my team, who I didn't realize had different neurodiverse traits, mm started being more open about their neurodiverse traits. Yeah. And there's some roles that are just brilliant for people that are neurodiverse. So, you know, engineering teams, autism is a f absolute superpower yeah. for engineering. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's not, it's been a kind of more because I'm open, it makes it an open place for also other people to be open. And yeah. then recognizing also that in interviews, it's, you know, you, there's those biases that you can have about certain neurodiversity, but it's being open to that, which yeah. has been the most important thing. No, I doubt I've, um, so literally since I stole that sig email signature from you, like it has opened so many conversations where there are people all around us who are hiding um, their neurodiversity because unfortunately there still is a bit of a stigma around it in the world. Um, and. I guess the decision to do that has been like, it's been liberating for a lot of people as well as for myself. Like now I don't feel scared if I write an email and there's a typo and it's like, you, you will survive. Um, although one of my experiences in the corporate world, I remember art skin HR from allowed to include it in my signature and they said no. Um, and that was a really weird experience. Cause I was like, but, so what are you trying to say? I need to hide who I actually am um, in that regard. So yeah. And it's not constructive. And the thing is, is there's such brilliant strengths and there are negatives like right, you know I, I have some real challenges so you know but lean into your strengths so 35 percent of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40 percent of self-made millionaires and as only 10 percent of the population have dyslexia we're more likely to be entrepreneurs and when we are we're more successful so um lean into those entrepreneurial strengths that's yeah. brilliant and also recognize that you, I'm never going to be able to code, right? <laughs> I, I can't spell. <laughs> I would be, the code would be a very scary place to be. <laughs> In your career to date, have there been any other, I guess, really difficult choices you've had to make? Yeah, so, I mean, COVID was horrific yeah. for everyone, right? Um, uh, what happened with us is with the dots, obviously we're a community based platform, but we made money through jobs. So people advertising jobs on the platform. Mm -hmm. um, in about a week, I saw 60% of our revenue disappear wow. overnight. Um, and it was just 
terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, so very long story short, um, my board um, were encouraging me to get rid of my team mm -hmm. uh, or a lot of my team to basically extend our runway. And yeah. um, however, I'd made a promise to my team that I've always been transparent. This is a startup, right? We, we, there's a likelihood we can fail, but if we do, I will get you a job before I go and like cry at home and, <laughs> and collapse and have that holiday I haven't had in eight months. Mm. I'm eight years. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I always made them the promise that if something went wrong with the dots, I would find you another role before. And that was the one time I wasn't going to be able to keep that promise because mm. there was no jobs going in COVID. So I was yeah. like, there is no way I'm getting rid of this team. That's the one promise I made. So very long story short, I end up having a very big board discussion. <laughs> I'll use my words carefully here. <laughs> um, and I was like, I'm going to find a way through. And so um, as serendipity came about is we actually got contacted by um, the Soho House Group mm -hmm. uh, who wanted to build an app for Soho Works, which is their co-working space. Yeah. Um, and they got in touch and said, well, we love what you've done with the dots. Would you consider white labeling the technology for Soho Works? Um, and obviously I was like, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we found a way through and we started white labeling the dots. Um, we now have 23 partners. We shipped our first product 19 months ago. No one knows we're doing this because we haven't even had time to talk about it there isn't even a website yeah. um so really i have this baby which is the dots and then we have like 23 other partners um so funnily enough i've moved a team an operational team running the dots now mm. and i'm running this thing entity up here which we haven't got a Nameless. brand name for <laughs> yeah. we started to think of the dots as one of our partners one of right. our clients um and it's just been this most magical kind of journey seeing my tech now adopted by all these different other communities when things have gone hard you know that was one of the most horrific it sounds like that was an easy process it mm. wasn't it was the most terrifying bit where i have to i have to find a way through i have to find something that is gonna keep us in business so that i don't have to let my team yeah. go and that was just grit yeah <laughs> basically that's amazing so first, I do want to acknowledge that you did this drop an exclusive on uh, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're now talking about it. Um, so, yeah. uh, um, <laughs> with a brand name unknown, by the way. So whatever this new brand is. Um, uh, that that yeah. could be a name, brand name unknown. Brand name unknown. <laughs> um, but beyond that, um, I do want to ask, what was it like going against your boards? So they told you to do one thing, but your gut as a founder said to do otherwise. I mean, it was horrific. Um, luckily, I have an amazing, our chairman of our board is this amazing guy called John Hegarty, um, who started BBH, um, and he really had my back. Mm -hmm. And so that was brilliant. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the time, we didn't know, I d that, you know, somehow I hadn't got in touch. We yeah. just, I just had to work out what we were going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it's complete, sleepless nights and you know mild panics and you know transparency with the team but also just will I actually be able to do it yeah um but we did find a way and I think if you if you really want something work really hard you can find a way mm. um but yeah it was it was horrific at the time I can imagine <laughs> Even the um, choice to be transparent with your team, that is, that's still a decision you need to make. Like, what led you to make that decision? Well, I've always, I've always been transparent, so they've always known, like, how long we've got cash flow. Um, mm. You know, I don't give them all the gory details of board fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, um, but, yeah, I think that's always been my mantra with the team. It's not fair on them otherwise um and i think that security of always saying i'll always find your job has yeah. meant that everyone just gives it their crack uh, oh, their crack a crack <laughs> 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 um but yeah i mean that's that's i've i've never wanted to be one of 
those founders where decisions are made in a vacuum and you'll just dictate to your team. Actually, yeah. the team helps shape everything we do. So I'm, I'm probably overly transparent if I'm <laughs> honest, Claude. I'm sure sometimes they're like, please don't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, yeah, I think it's really important because then they can be collaborative in the solution, yeah. right? And actually, sorry, one of the things that happened off the arch, we, uh, people did take a pay cut because they knew what was happening. Right. So um, the founding team took the biggest pay cut um, seniors took the next biggest mid levels next, and we didn't cut any of the pay of the juniors. Right. So we basically all came together That's to make amazing. that happen. And then when we got through it, everyone got back to their original pay, but we also gave them a ten percent pay rise as well. That's amazing. So, but you know, that was them all coming together. Yeah. My actually head of back engineering offered to cut his entire salary. I was like, wow. no way! <laughs> You're amazing. Mm. I'm not doing that to you. But um, but yeah, that was it. Was all of us grinding it through together. Yeah. Which is magic. I just want to take a minute just to let you know about an amazing book that I've read this year. My friend Kenny Methadon has written a book called That Peckham Boy. It's an autobiography about his life and his journey up until this point. And I can say without a doubt, it's the best book I've read in 2023. Check it out, I hope you enjoy, but also let me know what you think about it. I'm hearing three themes coming up in terms of how you make decisions. Um, I'm hearing be guided by your values, uh, trust your gut, and be collaborative with it. Um, actually, a fourth is also do do use data, um, but don't make don't let data be the deciding factor. And I think the other one, actually, when I was sort of thinking about it, was actually sometimes you just have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Like I think when I was starting out, I would sort of sit in limbo land, like, am I going to make the wrong decision? Am I going to make the right? But actually, being in that limbo land is really bad, right? Because you're not doing one way or the other. Yeah. So I've just got better at making a decision as quickly as possible so everyone knows where we're going. Mm. And I think more importantly, especially when you have a team, making sure everyone is aligned behind that decision. Because yeah. the worst thing that can happen is if you've made a decision, but one team's going off in a different direction and you're going off in this direction, you don't know which if it's right or wrong. Yeah. So you're always gonna make the wrong decisions. I've made so many wrong decisions. <laughs> but the important thing is we make the decision, we're aligned behind it, we test it, validate it, and we quickly realize it's the wrong decision and we can change that decision yeah. and move somewhere else. But if you're not, if you're in limbo land or people are going off in directions, you just don't know what's right, what's wrong. Yeah. Um, but if you're working together, you can go, okay, actually that wasn't the right thing. Let's do that instead. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you get people to align behind the decision even when you don't know if it's the right one? So I think it's transparency again, collaboration again, don't like make a decision and just tell them that's a decision. It's like yeah. get people involved. So we do, we use something called the unkillable process. Okay. Um, it's based on um, uh, objectives and key results, which are a bit like KPIs. Yeah. But the problem with KPIs is their performance, you have to hit them. When you're scaling a business, you don't know if they're realistic or not. So yeah. OKRs are aspirational. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, you shoot for the moon, you land in the stars type yeah. situation, mm -hmm. but you're not accountable for them. And yeah. the unkillable process is basically where you have core and explore OKRs. So the yeah. core ones you can bet your house on and the explore ones are more like, I'm not sure if this is the right decision, but let's test it and go. And sorry, back to your original question. The reason that's so important for the team is they have a kind of a model to work around. So they right. know why the explore OKRs are the ones where like, we're probably wrong, but we're going to test it. And yeah. the core ones are like, this is what we have to definitely focus on. For yeah. there, so. Just for clarity, because we you did use both terms. So um, OKRs are objectives and key results. Objectives and key results. Yeah. And then we split them into explore ones. Mm -hmm where these are things where we might be right, we might be wrong. Yeah. And then core ones, which are, we've validated them, let's focus on yeah. them. And that's a principle that was made popular by Google, is that right? OKRs, yeah, yeah. were. Unkillable was what every, all the startups started adopting because they realized even with OKRs, sometimes you're just testing and iterating so much. Yeah. Um, OKRs can be set for too long. So mm. you're like, you're trying to achieve a goal, but you don't know how to get to that goal. So the yeah. unkillable model kind of balances the two. That's awesome. Um, Do you happen to know where people can learn more about the unkillable model? Oh my gosh. Do you know, I don't think it's online. So what I'm going to do, Claude, I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> I've got a whole slide deck on it. And anyone who contacts you, you yeah. can get in contact with. So You know what? That's um, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Another decision that you've made, and I guess where we've gone in separate directions, is uh, around funding. 
So you started off with investment right from the beginning of your business. Um, what made you go for that decision? So, yeah, I mean, I seed funded the business originally from my exit in Australia, but yeah, mm. we've been through three rounds yeah. of investment. Um, why? Because tech is very expensive um, yeah. and engineers are very expensive. Mm -hmm. So, and it was kind of the thing to do yeah. back then. You yeah. know, this is eight years ago. I was yeah. like, yeah, I've got an app and I'm going to raise some investment. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then you forget that actually when you raise investment, you're giving up a part of your company, right? Yeah. You are no longer the boss. Mm -hmm. You are accountable to shareholders. They own a percentage of your business. It's a yeah. completely different business. So I think I somewhat sort of naively went in there. Um, somewhat from necessity because I don't have an engineering background. So I yeah. needed to build tech that I couldn't afford to build. And the money I made from Australia wasn't enough to scale that through. Yeah. However, the problem with raising money is I also spent stuff that I should never have spent. Mm. Like we spent loads on Instagram ads and Facebook ads. Yeah. What a disaster. Anyone listening, like get, this is one thing you definitely need to look, look at your data for. Mm. So we spent loads on Instagram. Loads of people were signing up to the dots. We're like, this is amazing. Yeah. About six months later, we were like, are those people still on the dots? Yeah. And no, they just churned. And we suddenly yeah. realized that was a complete waste of investment. So that was one where the data did tell us the right thing yeah. or did, did was should have guided us. So. Yeah, I think the problem with money as well is you like suddenly have this money and also you have investors like grow, grow, grow. Yeah. And we almost grow too quickly. You mm. know, we're a million members now, but that's great. But at the same time, I actually tell all our partners grow slower. So you learn more about your community and you can yeah. help them more. We almost scaled too quick mm. that it was a bit discombobulated. <laughs> yeah. So that was. No, I, I definitely get that. And I think that's part of the reason why I've like all the things you said as part of the reason why I've chosen to do the opposite. Yeah. Um, I will raise investment at some point, but actually the advice that once again you gave me, if you don't, you might not remember it, is get product market fit yeah. and then add investment to grow. So yeah. don't use investment money to try and find out what your real product is meant to be. And that's exactly what yeah we did. And that's why Meta and Instagram just didn't work because yeah. the product wasn't there yet. Yeah. Um, and so product market fit should have been everything. Yeah. But also, if you can do it without investment, if someone can do it without investment, mm. and I, like that's an amazing way to go as well. Because yeah, as I said, it's raising investment is a bit like going into a relationship, but without the benefit of makeup sex. It's basically, <laughs> <laughs> you're stuck with them oh, forever. At least it's not meant to include that. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, there's some really bad investors out there. Luckily, they're not on my cap table. But yes, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's you know you are you can't get rid of them until you get rid of your business. Yeah, essentially, and that's it. Yeah, so it's a route you really need to think very yeah. carefully about. Uh, there's an incident that happened a few years ago um, where, actually, do you know what I'm referring to with the uh, recruitment process? Yeah. Do you, can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we obviously with the DOTS, we were working with all these companies that were using the DOTS to hire. And one of the things they could do on the platform was search for profiles um, and look for profiles. And there was a huge amount of research that was coming out around bias and that people make decisions on looking at, like if you're doing a search, say, for videographers and you get a list of videographers, people make a snap judgment in like 0 0.01 second if they should put them into their short list or not. Yeah. At the same time, there was lots of research that was also coming out that say someone called Adam was four times more likely to hit a sh short list than someone called Mohammed. Right. And so um, on the dots, we launched like a bias free browsing toggle that our partners could use that basically hid anything where you could make snap decisions. So profile picture, educational background, companies you've worked at, because that's the other thing, like mm. it's much easier as a junior to get into a really famous company if you're more affluent, that sort of thing. So yeah. we removed all that. Um, and then we got a really um, big backlash on Twitter. Um, and it was probably, probably the worst 24 hours of my 24 hours of my life. Oh, actually, that sounds really dramatic, but it probably was. <laughs> 24 hours of my career. Yeah. There's some yeah. stuff that happens. Um, and I can understand why it happened. Like, I have a hidden 
disability, but I don't know what it's like to be hidden mm. because of something someone can see. Um, and in hindsight, it was a decision that we made with the right intentions, but we should have done more consultation. Yeah. And it was just one of those things that I learned a lot about that process. I'm very grateful for very dear friends like yourself who helped mentor me <laughs> through that process. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, you know, we all, I've always gone into this wanting to build, like our, our algorithm is based on positivity and kindness, the kind of the community are, the higher they come off. And I always wanted to build a positive environment, not a negative. And so that was the one time where I let myself down, but also, I just, it was just a, one of those things where I've just, it was just horrific in the eye of the storm. Yeah. Um, and so you learn, I guess, you learn from mistakes. Um, and I mean, the interesting bit with it is, yeah, you just, I have this little sticky on my computer of mistakes to never repeat. And yeah. one of them is just more consultation on some features. Yeah. You can't do that on everything though. Yeah. And that's the challenge, especially as a small business, it's quite hard as you're scaling. You're yeah. gonna make mistakes. If yeah. We all make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, 100%. percent I guess, how do you find that balance when, yeah, when to go down this whole consultation process versus we just need to get something up and running? Um, well, we have a beta club now, which are amazing. So that's like a community that we give early releases to. Um, but we have actually all the other communities we have, we have like either what we call founding member groups or committees. Mm. Yeah. And so we release everything early to them. And I think when it comes to, and then there's certain things where we're like, you know, this is something that we need to be more conscious of and build a huge, bigger sort of um, more experts around the decision. But I think what's lovely around making it also very collaborative with our community is they, they pick stuff up really quickly. But yeah. also I love my community because they, 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 we get the loveliest complaint emails. It's like, I love the dots, but. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, bless you, you're amazing. I think people who use us, they know that our intentions are good. We're not always gonna get it right. And yeah. so, um, but yeah, we love, we love feedback. You can't grow unless you're getting feedback from yeah. the community on what's working and what isn't. I think that's another principle that you've just uh, pointed out. So yeah, this idea of collab um, consultation with the people you're trying to serve. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, feedback, I would, one expression I stole from my sister is um, I'm always now repeating the feedback is a gift. Yeah. Um, it's both a gift to the person receiving it, but it's also a gift that you can give others. So if you can build a community that feel, feels it that way and sees it that way, then yeah, like it, it results in successful businesses, I find. I love that because in our training deck, so for all our partners that we onboard, we have mm. like a training deck for that app, um, for their apps. And one of them is feedback is a gift. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Direct messages on our product is where the magic happened. If you get the feedback, that's the perfect way to kind of evolve and iterate what you're doing. So yeah. I love that. So. <laughs> um, just because we did touch on it a little bit earlier, but I do want to go into a little bit more information or detail mm -hmm. on it. So you have this new brand unknown <laughs> situation. You have all these amazing partners. You've told us about days. Can you tell us about any others or are they top secret? Yeah, so Apple was one, of terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, so we're 180 The Strands um, networking platform. So for anyone who doesn't know 180, it's the new kind of creative hub that's on the Strand near Somerset House. So it's very kind of fashion mm -hmm. focused. Freeze, which is their Freeze Art Fair. Um, that's, the f that's the most interesting one for me in the fact that it's the first one that's social, not okay. professional. So that yeah. is more talking about our exhibition and it's not about getting work um, and yeah we've got a, a brand called Adorium which is like a founders club so we're doing more and more founders ones yeah. and business ones so yeah it's just kind of really magic seeing and we're yeah. UAL's alumni platform for as well so but Amazing. for their founders and freelancers and my favorite recent one is the Brit School so we're looking after the Brit School which is Oh my God, they're so driven. It's like the last year, final year Brit school kids and yeah. their alum as well. So. Amazing. And also just for clarity, what is the platform or that you're providing for them on that white label? So it's basically a white label app. So right. it's um, it's our app, our app that we have in the app store, but mm. it's white labeled for these different communities. It's their color palette, mm. their branding, their community. So if you tried to get into the 180, so if you downloaded 180 Studios, 
tried to get into the app, um, yeah. it uh, basically recognizes, are you a tenant in the building? Are you not? So you have to be a tenant in the building right. to join it. Yeah. If you are a tenant, you can join that space. And then it's essentially a space. So the only thing that doesn't exist on any of our white label apps is jobs. It's all around um, events, connecting around events, direct messaging, connecting with individuals in that space. And why I'm so excited about the Days Club app, which is coming out now, is yeah. the first one that's open to everyone. Right. So um, Days have this amazing um, Days Club Club, which is all about opportunities for the industry and so that's the first one that anyone can download and join and that's all days club branding days club opportunities day club community so Amazing. that's gonna be great and although you haven't said it yet and you probably wouldn't because of, uh, i know you you're humble in that regard but it sounds like this is a great financial opportunity for you as well yeah i mean it is to be completely transparent i mean mm. it's you know it's the majority of our revenue now mm. um and if i'm honest again recruitment was probably the worst business model ever <laughs> um why because um one as i said jobs people don't really get work through jobs so i was yeah. making money from people posting jobs but the majority of my community were getting jobs from meeting each other so yeah. it was a bit of a weird circle Secondly, um, I just hated how the companies never got back to people, but I was selling to companies because we had to make money. Yeah. The other thing is that as soon as something happens like COVID or an economic downturn, yeah. all the money disappears. So we might have got through COVID maybe, but then jobs are going down again now, we wouldn't yeah. have survived now. So yeah. um, this is way more sustainable because yeah. it's a long-term subscription. So thank God, because we couldn't have gone through another downturn. And yeah. I think the other thing is recruiters just move all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so mm. it's not like our oh, products don't still have jobs on, but they're all people posting those now. Is someone yeah. doing a call out and saying, can you recommend a videographer? So you're actually talking to a human. You're not talking to a vacuous job with a non-human behind it and an HR person that's never going to get back yeah. to you. So I way prefer it that way. I'd rather Claude post I'm hiring yeah. than, you know, this weird brand never getting back to you and doing it through a recruiter or a talent manager. Yeah. Well, massive congratulations on Bless that. You. Massive, <laughs> you worked hard, you massively deserve it. So I'm it's kind of fluke as well. <laughs> 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 Found a serendipity. <laughs> Yeah, but it is, but the reality is one that I've kind of learned in business or life no. is when you don't quit, sooner or later you end up with the right answer. Yeah. So and you hang in there, you went you went through COVID, you didn't drop your team. So as much as it's serendipity and a bit of luck, which we all need to be successful, like you did the hard part of sticking by your values and like believing in your your team and your objective yeah and you're you're right i mean like it's it's about not giving up um and i really believe it's about being nice but the actually the interesting bit with the so house partnership is the guy who mentioned us in a meeting with nick jones who is the founder yeah he used to work at vice and right. when he left vice he came to me for advice advice, advice, <laughs> advice, advice. Um, when he left vice he came to me for advice on his next career move and he mm. was interested in joining tech so i took him to a couple of tech networking events yeah. he decided he didn't want to join i think he would met too many bitcoin founders and was like this is way too scary <laughs> for me um but he ended up at um the vinyl factory which is linked to so house and he mentioned us in that right. meeting and so sorry the reason i mentioned that is yeah it's sort of like not giving up but also it's amazing how many times I've basically helped someone out, not for any reason, and then like five, seven years time, they're helping me out, and that's like the power of a network, you know, yeah. just be a nice person, it always comes back around yeah. um, when you need it. Without a doubt, you have been so intentional uh, in terms of not necessarily growing your network because, oh, this person's useful, that person's useful, but just giving and sharing, and I love how what you've just said is a perfect example of when you do treat relationships like that, it mm. does eventually come back to you in one way or another. There's this amazing kind of piece of research that was talking about people who give and people who take. Mm. And they were saying that actually the most successful people are the ones that give. Um, and also the most unsuccessful people are the ones that give, but we're never the mm. medium ones. And um, I guess there's layers of giving, right? Yeah. There's, there's a giving that is positive and constructive. And then, you know, we've all been in, relationships where we're giving and we're not getting anything back at yeah. all um but you know i think that whole like i've just i think maybe it's from when i was young i had to have so much help i'm always willing to help others if i can and so yeah. it's always just come back around but 
I yeah. just, that's just be a nice person. Yeah. It's just the, it's the easiest networking kind of tip ever. Just be kind, be nice, yeah. help people if you can help them. Yeah. I mean, it's also a magic feeling where you're like, I know that person, I can connect you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I guess that's why I built a networking platform. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've never actually put two and two together because I do believe in mm. giving, et cetera. And I've always said that's because I feel like I've had so much given to me. But I didn't realize until you just said it that I had so much, I had to depend on so many people throughout my life because of my dyslexia. So I don't know about you, but the first part of my life, I was so, it was so like debilitating. Yeah. Um, I couldn't really do anything um, in terms of like, I couldn't read this by myself. I couldn't like write that, et cetera. I couldn't struggle with emails. So I had to depend on people around me. And um, because I've had so many people that were willing to be so patient with me and pour into mm -hmm. me, like at this point, I feel like I've got so much that I want to give back because of that, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same. I mean, I couldn't read till I was 11. Yeah. And you, you know what it's like when you're at school and they're all like, oh, that's, mm. she's stupid. My yeah. mum, amazing, was not having any of it. But mm. um, yeah, you just, you learn very young that actually you have to rely on other people. Yeah. Um, but then you can help other people too. And you, that kind of, it's magical, right? Because it, it means then everyone's focusing on their strengths instead of doing everything. And yeah. collaboration just grows the pie for everyone. Everyone's got to stop trying to eat each other's pie. Let's all just grow the pie together. There's, there's, there's enough pie. <laughs> there is, there's a pie, which if we work together would be this massive pie yeah. <laughs> that we could all work together. 100%. Um, and I think that's sort of the key. But yeah, we, we, I guess we have a massive advantage that we learned that, that empathy. early. Yeah, yeah, legitimately. <laughs> and also that empathy of like, what is it like when you're really struggling and you need that help? Um, cause yeah, I like you, like my team is amazing. Um, I a hundred, like, I look like I do all these amazing things and yes, I do, but what people don't see is like just how much I'm being supported. But I guess to begin to wrap things up, I do just want to say thank you, Pip, for, for being here today, but also thank you for all that you have invested into multiple communities over the years. Um, like without a doubt. Dream Nation, like, yeah, your contribution to that, whether that was taking the time to be, in, to be at an event, speak for us or to open doors for us, or just even be, give me advice or encouragement has meant a lot. And with that is part of why I'm now able to bring this back to the world and hopefully make a huge difference. And I know there's so many other people that have nothing but amazing things to say about what, you, what you've done and who you are, so. On behalf of everybody, thank you. Oh, bless you. <laughs> but same, same to you, Claude. Like, everything you've done is unbelievable. So maybe it's dyslexic, which we're not very good at taking compliments. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was my final question for you, Pip. If I could have anybody else in this podcast, who would you recommend? It would be Natasha Chowanda, and she was the founder of Bow and Arrow. Okay. Um, it's an agency. It was 20 people when they sold it to Accenture. Mm. She scaled it to 200 people. And wow. she's literally the badassest female boss with the biggest heart. Mm. Um, and she has just um, now she's built that business and sold it. Um, she is now focusing on her next venture, which is having a baby while she focuses on her next thing. And she Amazing. would be an incredible woman to talk to because I have no idea what it would be like to sell to something like Accenture. <laughs> that's huge. That's so huge. Oh, that's amazing. That would no, I wouldn't note that down. But Pip, once again, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you'd like more information on dyslexia and how the BDA can support you, please visit bdadyslexia.org.uk. We release new episodes every Sunday, so make sure that you subscribe and follow us so that you never miss out. If you'd like some more inspiration while you wait for the next new episode, then check out the recommendation above. Don't forget to follow us on social media and you can send us a question or a dilemma that you'd like us to answer on the podcast. This is Claude Williams, you've been watching Behind the Dreams and we look forward to seeing you at the next Dream Nation event.